Welcome everybody. My name is Stephen and I'm here to be your moderator this evening. Um, my pleasure to welcome you. I'm excited to welcome Ty Ramsey, uh, leading dental industry expert with a focus on CBCT for a brand agnostic unbiased approach to choosing the best CBCT for your practice. So before we get started and before I hand over to Ty, I'd like to take a moment to go over some basic housekeeping. Um, firstly, if you have a question at any point during um, this evening's webinar, uh, you can go ahead and type it in the Q&A section and that should be at the bottom of your screen in Zoom and we'll try and answer as many of your questions live uh, at the end of um, uh, Ty's presentation. And the second point is C is not available for this webinar, either live or on demand. So with that taken care of, uh, Ty, welcome. I'm going to pass it on over to you now. All right. Thanks for having me. Um, happy to be here. Happy to be doing this webinar for um, Henry Schein. My, my uh, relationship with Henry Schein goes all the way back to 2008. Um, they're a great company and I'm honored to be doing this webinar for them. So I will just share my screen and we will get right to it. All right. Um, the title of the presentation this evening is uh, Finding the Best Cone Bean or CBCT for your dental practice and industry as expert weighs in. I guess they have designated me as the industry expert. Um, I am um, the principal for Ramsey Consulting, LLC. Um, that is my current position. If you would like uh, more information, there is my website and uh, QR code, and I'll put that up at the end of the webinar as well. And uh, you're probably in shock from two very distinctive different accents. So um, Stephen has a much more sophisticated sound than me, but um, anyway, um, get right to the agenda. Uh, first, we'll do the introduction, um, then we'll go through the benefits of CBCT, and then we're going to determine, uh, going to show you how to determine the best CBCT for your specific practice, and going to go over best practices for evaluating manufacturers' offerings. And then going to evaluate, uh, go over the impact of adding CBCT to your practice. And then we're going to uh, finish it up with Q&A. So the purpose of this presentation is first to educate you and then enlighten you. Um, and uh, most importantly, um, if you're considering a cone beam, I want to put you in a position to make an informed decision on a very major investment. Um, a CBCT is, uh, you know, very often the uh, the largest investment on a single piece of equipment that a doctor ever makes. And more than anything else, I want to remain unbiased. I am not a rep for any company. I have no affiliations with any company, so I feel. Um, that I can be completely unbiased in my assessments here. So we'll start with who is this guy? Who's who, who's Ty? Well, I'm not this guy. Hey, Tom Bodet from Motel Six. I often get confused with that. People have told me I sound like Tom Bodet from Motel Six for years. So, uh, but who am I? I'm, well, I'm a newlywed. This is uh, got married in December. Um, have two lovely stepdaughters and a lovely wife, Ava, who's 13, um, and London, who's eight, and my lovely wife there. So suddenly I'm outnumbered by women. There is one other man in the house that's George W. Puss, my 12-year-old cat. And then I the only son to two octogenarians, my mom and my dad, which means that I also have a full-time job of senior citizen IT support. I'm sure some of you in the audience can sympathize or empathize with me on that. Um, further, um, who am I from a, that was a personal point of view, from a professional point of view, uh, here is, Here's where I come from. I uh, have BBA in marketing, University of Texas, Macomb School of Business. 
1992. Um, got into the dental industry about 18 years ago, uh, 2005. At the time, it was a company called Cadent, which is uh, was acquired by Invisalign, and most of you know the, their main product now, the Itero Scanner. Back when I worked there, it, it really dates me, but uh, their main source of income was Dennis pouring up uh, stone models, mailing them in, and we would digitize them and send them the digital file for 40 bucks a pop. They were doing about 25,000 of those um, a month. So that shows how, how old I am. Um, 2008 uh, through 2022, I was an uh, imaging rep. I was an ICAT uh, manufacturer's rep for most of that time. was very blessed to have the opportunity to transact over $80 million in cone memes. Um, <clears throat> also had a few milestones during my career. In 2010, I discovered a protocol that was not being used that um, I suggested that we could use. It was a scan protocol that was a very low dose protocol. And I suggested that it could be used for um, orthodontics and the company agreed. And we started, uh, we started uh, pushing that protocol for orthodontics. And I think it really helped um, bring cone beam into the orthodontic market. At that time, um, uh, full SEF height scan um, was about 2X the dose of a 2D pan. Um, and later, um, later in the, in the uh, product life, it uh, became, we were able to do a full scan for lower dose, lower dose than a 2D pan. Um, in 2016, I had another another idea, which turned into the iCat V series cone beam machine, which is still around today. Um, 2018 and 19, I took on a national role. I was a national CBC specialist for orthodontics, oral surgery, and airway. Um, in 2020, I inherited a complete portfolio of dental imaging products um, from sensors um, all the way up to, to cone beam. Um, and then in uh, Q1 of 2022, um, I decided to take the plunge and go out on my own as an independent consultant. Um, a lot of what I do is, is cone beam consulting, things like this. Do a little bit in the 3D printing realm, but um, I spend probably the majority of my time um, in the mergers and acquisition space, uh, practice transitions, private equity space. So that's been um, a lot of fun, and that's uh, you know where I spend a, a good deal of my time. Uh, in my career, um, I had the opportunity to install, sell over 800 cone beams, view over 100,000 images. Um, there's not a lot I haven't seen. Um, just wanted to share a few interesting images with you I'd come across over the course of my career. Um, this is a cone beam image that was taken, in which you can see um, we've got cancer um, here. And, and luckily enough, this is a, a client of mine, luckily enough, this. This gentleman's life was basically saved by a, a cone beam image. Um, he, his entire jaw had to be replaced, but they actually caught the cancer in time and saved this gentleman's life. Um, <clears throat> this one was a, uh, this, this uh, person lived too. This was um, supposedly a gang member that had been shot in the mouth, um, and then they took a cone beam after when they were doing the repair, and you can see, um, you know, pretty unique image there with the bone fragmentation and whatnot. Um, yes, uh, this gentleman received the Purple Heart. He was a combat Marine, met him a number of times, um, was a patient of another client of mine. Um, he actually got shot in the head, and they couldn't um, dislodge the bullet, and the bullet shows up on his on his cone beam scan, and he, he's doing great, by the way. 
Um, and then here is another unique view here. This is actually internal root resorption in a single tooth. That, that was uh, something that would not be visible in just a bite with me. And then this one, very unique. If you look closely, we've got a tooth in the nasal cavity. So lots of interesting things I've seen, lots of developments in the industry I've seen over my career. Um, since I joined, um, since I got into the cone beam space in 2008, here's sort of a timeline of what has happened all these years. Uh, the, not on, on the, the graph here, but um, the first in-office cone beam was in 2005. Uh, but I joined um, in 2008. Um, at the time that I was selling cone beam um, in 2008, it was all about, well, yeah, it's a cone beam. I occasionally need 3D images, but I'm really more concerned with how good of a 2D pan or Seth it can produce. Um, cone beam at that point was used occasionally for one-offs. Um, used primarily for, you know, implants, not all the time, uh, you know, not most of the time, probably, but um, also used for orthognathic surgery. At that point in time, the, uh, uh, the, the main segment of the dental population that was using cone beam was uh, oral surgeons, and it wasn't even a majority of them then. Um, then in 2010, which led up to 2011 and 12, um, low-dose cone beam options began to emerge. Um, orthodontists and implantologists began to regularly adopt cone beam. Uh, a, a minority of uh, general practitioners, um, or a minority of practitioners, started actually using cone beam on every patient. Um, and the AAOMR declared cone beam the preferred method of radiography for assessing implant placement. 2013 um, was a, a bit of a tipping point in that um, a cone beam was released that could actually do a, a full Ceph height scan for less dose than a 2D pan. Um, since, since then, most other manufacturers have followed with a sim pretty similar low-dose options. Um, this, in 2013, that was huge for orthodontics. That was a real tipping point. Orthodontics really started to adopt the technology, and many practitioners developed an all-3D, all-the-time philosophy. Um, fast forward to 2015, technologies continue to improve. Um, that's really when sleep dentistry started taking off and whole health dentistry. Um, there began to be multiple collaborations between dentists and MDs, really a whole health approach. Um, CBCT became uh, fairly common amongst all specialties. Um, and like I said, most manufacturers by that time uh, had begun to release their own low-dose options. Um, then fast forward to 2022, 2023, um, I would say the majority of top practitioners in the dental space own a cone beam. Um, the product is, is reaching uh, maturity. Still, um, it's still less than half of all practitioners own one, but it is um, especially in oral surgery, orthodontics, implantologists, and in those segments, I would say, um, you know, approaching half or over half in, in some cases. Um, also, pediatric dentistry, believe it or not, has uh, begun to adopt cone beam as we are discovering or, or they are discovering that, you know, many kids have been misdiagnosed with sleep related or have been misdiagnosed with uh, ADHD and it's actually a sleep related breathing disorder. So uh, the ability to have a cone beam that takes um, the, the full dentition and can get upper and lower airway is invaluable in assessing those sleep-related breathing disorders, both in children um, and adults. Also, um, one thing that's been really exciting is that um, artificial intelligence is emerging. Um, 
most uh, major manufacturers of cone beam are incorporating or developing some type of artificial intelligence to go along or in with their software. And that's a nice segue to this quick video on the next slide. Um, I really do like this slide. It's just a nice summary of uh, really tells you where we're going from a technology standpoint. Once upon a time, business as usual was often good enough. No more. Where we are going, good enough is dead. In a world where everything is connected, where everything is equally excellent, where performance is reaching perfection, there's only one space left to innovate in, you. Right now, you are a central point in the raging tornado of change fueled by digitization, mobilization, augmentation, disintermediation, automation. Well, the list goes on. Science fiction is becoming science fact. Think about self-driving cars or computers that can learn and think. The way we work will never be the same. The skills we need will be dramatically different. Winning or losing are now happening faster than ever before. So what's your response? How will you discover new opportunities in one of the most transformational times in human history? Are you driving change or are you being driven by it? Disruption has become the new normal. With change, it's always gradually, then suddenly, well, things really have stopped happening gradually. This change is exponential. Everything that used to be dumb and disconnected is now wired and intelligent. Cars, cities, ports, farms, even our bodies will be wired with sensors and will talk to each other. These game changers are also combinatorial. They amplify each other, creating a perfect storm of change. Quantum computing fuels big data. The Internet of Things fuels artificial intelligence and deep learning, which fuels robotics. However, anything that cannot be digitized or automated will become extremely valuable. Human-only traits such as creativity, imagination, intuition, emotion, and ethics will be even more important in the future because machines are very good at simulating but not at being. Yes, robots and software will do some of our work, but this will allow us to focus on things that cannot be automated. To imagine change squared, you've got to start engaging more with what might be, not just with what is. Immerse yourself in the immediate future, five to seven years out from today. We need to go beyond technology and data to reach human insights and wisdom. Technology represents the how of change, but humans represent the why. The future is about holistic business models. The opportunity is to be liquid, to learn just in time, not just in case, not single improvements, but complete transformations, not individual systems, but new ecosystems. Humanity is where true and lasting value is created. We will engage, rate, and buy things because of the experiences they provide, because of their transformative power. The future doesn't just happen. The future gets happened. The new way to work is to embrace technology, but not to become it. The future is in technology, yet the bigger future lies in transcending it. Let's live and lead from here. Really like that video. It just kind of helps put it in perspective just how um, how rapidly things are moving in the technology age. Um, uh, there's some statistic that every uh, every two years we process more information than we did the previous 50. So think about that for a minute. Um, so on back to the agenda, I'm going to get right into the benefits of cone beam in your practice, and they are many. 
Um, the benefits of cone beam, it, it's not just for implants anymore. It can be, it, cone beam can have a, uh, a positive impact on virtually every procedure in your practice. Implants, endo, ortho, airway, extractions, crowns, sinus lifts, all kinds of pathologies, TMJ, trauma, fractures. Um, the, the, there is no single piece of equipment that I've come across that can be used for more and on basically every patient um, than a cone beam. Um, a, a great thing to do if you're wondering, you know, you know, how can I benefit from this and how, you know, I'd really like to see it used on multiple procedures, but how, you know, you could get um, your sales rep to come in, your Henry Shine rep or along with the uh, manufacturer rep or, or both um, and kind of do a before and after demo. You know, here, here's how I'm doing implants now. Here's how I would do them if I had this cone beam. That's a really useful exercise to go through and you can go through that on on root canals, airway, the whole deal. So I, I recommend um, getting a demo of, of that type. It can be very helpful. Also, um, if you think if you struggle with second opinions, I've had literally dozens, if not hundreds, of my former clients or my always my clients of my clients tell me that. Um, that they are the last stop for second opinions if they have a cone beam. That reveal moment of the full 3D, which is a surprise to patients. They've hardly ever seen anything like it. Um, that reveal moment to them, they know they are in the right place and it allows you to keep more of those second opinions. Also should increase your referral base, both from patients and your referring dentist who don't have a cone beam. Um, it's also got a great marketing component. Think about it. If you're driving down, I like to call it the clueless dental consumer. If the clueless dental consumer is driving down the road and they see Smith dentistry and then they see Smith 3D dentistry, well, who is, you know, the, the clueless dental consumer, which 99% of them are, they are more apt to stop into uh, Smith 3D dentistry. And the ones that aren't clueless are certainly more apt to stop in Smith 3D dentistry because they know the benefits of a cone beam. Also, more than anything, the bottom line is enhanced patient care. Uh, cone beam, quite simply, the view in 3D allows you to see more on every patient. And when you see more, you treat more. Um, there's also a billing component to cone beam. There are both medical and dental codes that are now being build. Um, I have seen scans reimbursed from medical or dental insurance in the neighborhood, you know, anywhere from $50 up to um, in excess of $400. Um, and there are many billing consultants out there that can, you know, can help you with that as well. I'm not a billing consultant, but I'm just uh, parroting what other practitioners have told. So, on to the next agenda item, determining the best cone beam for your practice. Now, this is brand agnostic and unbiased. I'm just going to talk in generalities um, on how to pick a cone beam for your specific practice. So what are your needs? Ask yourself, what kind of resolution do you need? What FOV, which stands for field of view? Um, do you need, or what scan size do you need? Do you have the space for the cone beam? Um, if you have a pan Ceph, I would tell you that almost any cone beam will fit in that space. Um, if you just have a pan, there are there are still, um, you know, in general, uh, the footprints of these units um, are not much bigger than a pan. So normally you can replace your current equipment with a cone beam in the same place, but occasionally um, have to do some minor adjustments to squeeze it in. 
Um, also, software is a big consideration. Um, does the software fit all your needs? Does it have all the functionality you need? Is the software, um, does it fit in with your infrastructure and your workflow? Are you going to have to upgrade uh, machines around your office for the software? Um, is it cloud-based? And I, I, I can say that I haven't really come across any Conebeam software that is uh, strictly uh, cloud-based based just FYI uh, because of the the size of the images um, it, it, it's been my experience that you're going to almost always need local storage for the uh, cone beam images um, however you can back them up in the cloud um, what scan options do you need some practitioners, for instance, maybe super GPs, they might need a scan size from uh, five by five all the way up to uh, 20 by 20 and everywhere in between. If you're an ended honest, you might just need a five by five. If you're an ended honest doing implants, you might need an eight by eight um, and so forth. So just um, get with your Henry Shine rep and your uh, manufacturer of choice and they can help you make uh, that, that decision decision. Also, do you need a combo unit or not? And what I mean by combo unit, a combo unit is a unit, um, a cone beam unit, which has a separate 2D and 3D functionality. There are also cone beam units out there um, that um, have separate 3D and 2D functionality, but it's it's a shot off of the same sensor. Um, so it's it's just uh, you know of course up to you to decide if you uh, want to do all 3D all the time or if you'll still be taking 2D images. But I can tell you that many practitioners have moved to the um, all 3D all the time protocol. I'm not recommending uh, any way or the other. Again, that's up to you to um, determine. Um, ask your, you know, ask yourself, what do you currently use? Do you, do you use a 2D pan or do you use a 2D pan Ceph? As a general rule, if you're currently using a pan, then a small or medium field of view cone beam will fit your needs. And, and what I mean by a, a small field of view cone beam is going to be something that, I, in my mind, I consider off of the cone beam image in and of itself, the maximum volume, you cannot carve out a 2D pan. Um, a medium field of view is uh, what I consider to be um, a, a, the maximum field of view or image size you, is large enough to take the cone beam scan and then be able to reconstruct or carve a 2D pan out of the cone beam scan. So in general, uh, practitioners that uh, fit in with a small or medium field of view category or G GPs, endodontists, periodontists, prosthodontists. Um, as a general rule, if you routinely use a pan Ceph and you use your Ceph a lot, uh, then a full field of view cone beam will fit your needs. And I uh, categorize full field co cone beam as a cone beam that can take uh, an image uh, large enough where you could extract a Ceph out of the 3D image. Uh, normally that's going to be, you know, a minimum of about 13 centimeters high by uh, 14, 15 diameter. Um, and the minimum uh, diameter required right around the minimum diameter or scan size required to reconstruct a 2D pan out of the image is right around eight to nine centimeters in height by 14 centimeters approximately in diameter. Anything smaller than that, you're probably going to be uh, cutting off cutting off the condyles and you cannot get a, uh, a, a traditional looking pan out of the 3D image. But that's a nice thing about having a big enough cone beam image is that with one shot, you can get your full 3D and then carve your 2D pan or 2D Ceph if it's the extra large image out of, out of the same scheme. 
So the fields of view range approximately from uh, five by five up to 20 by 20, you know, five height by five diameter up to 20 height by 20 diameter. Uh, the scan volume, as I, as I mentioned before, is very important. Got ahead of myself a little. The eight by 14 is approximately the minimum volume in my experience needed to reconstruct a pan. Anything less than the 14 centimeter diameter will cut off the condyles, as I just said. Now we'll talk about resolution in voxels. So <clears throat> what is a voxel? Um, a voxel is just like a pixel on the TV, except it's a 3D version. So a voxel is a 3D pixel. Um, in theory, the smaller the voxel, the better the resolution or the higher the resolution and the better the image quality. Um, the size of voxels on various machines range from 0.05 millimeter up to 0.6 millimeter. Um, someone, for instance, an endodontist would have way more use for a 0.05 millimeter and would basically have no use for a 0.6 millimeter, but a orthodontist very well uh, used the 0.6 millimeter on every patient because it would be probably an extremely low dose and you can still see where the teeth and roots are in the bone. Um, if movement is eliminated, which is basically impossible to eliminate movement, um, then a smaller voxel or higher resolution equals better image quality. And that is true in general. Uh, but in the real world where there's movement, you know, there's often a, a patient movement, there's often a trade off between resolution and image quality. Um, some units on the market have motion reduction filters applied post scan to help improve the image quality. Um, some units have ergonomic advantages over others. There are sit down units, there are stand up units, there are um, stand up units with various modalities of um, keeping the patient uh, still. Same with sit down units. About 90% of all units on the market um, have the patient in a standing position. Um, and there are some trade-offs, as I mentioned, with the higher resolution scans. Um, a higher resolution scan means a higher dose of radiation to the patient. Um, and higher resolution scans, um, the scan is going around and taking more slices. So the scan in general is going, the higher the resolution, the longer the scan's gonna take. The longer the scan takes, uh, the more opportunity there is for the patient to move. Um, and also uh, artifact, motion, uh, artifact, both motion artifact and metal artifact can be um, increased or uh, on a uh, high resolution scan. Uh, most units, most softwares out there nowadays often uh, offer uh, uh, metal artifact reduction algorithms. Um, but again, the longer the scan time, you could um, deal occasionally with what we call motion artifact. And that's where uh, the patient moves because the scan was, you know, took quite a while. Um, my recommendation is to find a cone beam that consistently meets your needs on both image quality and workflow. Um, because if you're always going for the absolute best image quality possible, highest resolution possible, keep in mind that image is going to be larger. It's going to take longer to render. Um, so there's a happy medium between image quality, workflow, size of image, um, and your, your, your rep can help you determine that. Um, everyone has different needs. All practitioners have different needs from, you know, an endodontist has very different needs cone beam wise than an oral surgeon. Um, and in regards back to dose real quick, um, they're, they're uh, called the Alara principle. And now 
um, recently, um, the ALADA principle has come along. So ALARA is an acronym for as low as reasonably achievable in regards to um, radiation and exposure to patients on dental x-rays. The goal is to keep the radiation dose of the patient as low as possible while still obtaining the necessary diagnostic information. Um, it, it, and they, that last part is very important and gets left off a number of times. I think that's one of the most important parts. It's um, consistent with obtaining the necessary diagnostic information. On any cone beam scan you do, you're going to be getting exponentially more information than you would just off of a 2D pan. So a pretty strong argument can be made in many cases. Again, I'm not prescribing it. It's up to you as a practitioner to decide it. But a pretty strong argument can be made for taking a cone beam on, on most patients for, in that regard. Um, and then recently, um, uh, the acronym a lot of as a l a d a as low as diagnostically acceptable now that's the same as a laura but with flexibility on the acceptance of image quality for instance an orthodontist might have a much uh you know lower threshold of quality than an endodontist needs or an implantologist placing a uh, implant right directly next to a nerve you know an orthodontist uh, just looking at at roots in teeth and doesn't need quite that level of detail here's a good example if your goal here, this is kind of an analogy, if your goal here is to be able to read the letter E and that's it, either one of these images will suffice. So, you know, if your goal is just to be able to read the letter E, both of these are great. So if somehow this one was way less radiation, then let's go with this one. But if you need that fine detail in those crisp corners, then, you know, this would be the higher dose scan. On to the next topic, the best practices for evaluating uh, manufacturers' offerings. So there's tons of different manufacturers out there. Um, you know, various dealers carry various brands. Henry Schein has probably um, one of the uh, most comprehensive product mixes in regards to cone beam. Um, they carry, you know, all the major brands um, and have close relationships with all of the imaging companies in their portfolio. Um, but here are some important considerations in my mind whenever you are looking to make um, a, this major investment. First of all, um, you know, you want it to be done through a, a reputable dealer or distributor. Well, um, with Henry Schein, no problem there. They're the top dental distributor in the world. So, so very reputable. Also, um, it, it can be... It, very important to your your local rep, both your um, your local distributor rep and your manufacturer's rep. Um, they can play a big part in your success. So it's it's a very positive thing if you have a strong uh, local rep, and you might be in a situation in which you don't even have a local rep. So then. I would do my due diligence on, uh, you know, remote support capabilities and whatnot. But um, really, uh, you really can lean on your rep to make it a much better experience for you if you have a good rep. Um, and in support, and not and not just from the refs, I'm talking about corporate support, like customer service, 800 number support. Um, you know, there were many challenges in almost every company after COVID with support. Most of them have done a good job of recovering. Um, but, uh, you know, just make sure, do your due diligence and research and make sure that uh, this big investment you're about to make is, is supported uh, well. Um, in my mind, there are some cone beam companies out there that you can buy directly from. And in, in my mind, that is a risky proposition because most, if not all of them are, are um, 
you know, the, the smaller companies with very small market share, that means they have less infrastructure, less support. You never know what you're going to get. Um, in the cone beam realm, you really do get what you pay for is, is what I've found. So if you try to save a few thousand dollars, it can end up backfiring. Um, also, you're wondering, you know, how, when's the best time to get the best price on these? Should I wait for the special? Yeah, and my answer is no. Now, it, if you need a cone beam and you need it now, invest in one now because you could be waiting one quarter, two quarters. Uh, you know, what if you waited two quarters? Well, think about all the cases that you missed, all the opportunities for better patient care that you wasted or that you, that you, uh, you know, that you didn't come across because you didn't have a cone beam. And maybe you waited a couple of quarters to save just a couple thousand dollars. Well, you could have more than justified that by seeing more and treating more. So, um, you know, don't wait till the end of the year or whenever just for a special. In my mind, if you think you need one, then go invest, go invest in yourself. Um, but another tip, no matter what it is, just surround yourself with good people, work with good people, and the rest will take care of itself. Now on to the last uh, top item, and we should be finished in plenty of time here. It's the impact of adding a cone beam to your practice. So <clears throat> many different advantages, the first being productivity. Um, you can get a faster and more accurate diagnosis with cone beam. Um, one scan, um, an encyclopedia of information on the patient. That also lends itself to efficiency, as you see there below. But back to productivity, you can also keep more procedures in-house, whereas you might be sending out now every time, you know, maybe you're not placing implants. Um, and when you have, you know, you're sending out every patient that has that. If you got a cone beam, you could start placing implants, do that right in your office. Um, and it goes for that, you know, in, for many procedures. Um, it also allows you to, in many cases, expand your procedures and to expand collaboration. Um, which helps with the uh, productivity. And I've got ahead of myself the efficiency. Uh, like I said, one scan, um, if you choose the all 3D all the time uh, philosophy, then one scan gets you a full encyclopedia of information on every patient, which can be used for many different treatments. Um, and it's all about better patient care as well. What cone beam allows you to be a proactive practitioner instead of a reactive practitioner. Um, no more waking up in the middle of the night with a patient you put on watch, you know, hoping they don't call you in the middle of the night with emergency. You know, there's um, there's a, a study from University of Iowa. Um, I don't. They, I believe it was. 28% of all patients have asymptomatic lesions. Um, and only 25% of those lesions can be seen uh, in a bite wing. And 100% of those lesions can be seen in a cone beam. So just think about that for a minute and how much more proactive you can be and what better patient care you can be done. Um, also, cone beam, it really helps you get the patient involved. So there's no more, imagine uh, the Dawson Academy refers to this as co-diagnosis. So the traditional model of dentistry is you sitting across the desk from the patient, basically lecturing them on what they need, pointing to black and white images, and they just have to trust you. They really don't know what they're looking at, and they just have to blindly trust you and accept treatment. 
Well, in, in this new paradigm with all 3D all the time, especially the patient knows what they're looking at. When you show them their full dentition in 3D or their airway or their sinuses, they, they are real easily aware of what they are looking at. And they actually get involved and get excited. If you get a comb beam in your office, get used to the word wow, because you're gonna hear it a lot from patients. And they really get involved in the treatment plan with you. And the Dawson Academy calls that co-diagnosis. And it really helps you. Um, it really helps you with, with patient care and actually, you know, with, with starts and, and increasing procedures, just everything good about it. So there's no more guessing and you're going to see more and you're going to treat more. And all this adds up to superior patient care which also probably leads to patient retention and better reviews. Um, also, there's a big marketing component to cone beam if you want to. Again, remember the example of Smith Dentistry versus Smith 3D Dentistry. Patients are wowed by these 3D images. I've had many of my clients uh, tell me that one simple little trick brought them literally hundreds of thousands of dollars of additional uh, patients per year, simply having the patient use the supercomputer that they carry in their pocket, i.e. their smartphone, simply have the patient show them the 3D image and have the patient get out their phone and simply video the 3D image of their own x-ray. And what do they do? They show all their friends. It creates word of mouth. And before you know it, you're getting walk-in after walk-in that you wouldn't have gotten before by allowing the patient's cell phone to be a billboard for you. And that feeds right into your return on investment. Um, I think from what I previously said, you can you can say, you know, you can pretty easily figure out that there's a, a pretty rapid return on investment. Um, you know, there's another um, there's another uh, great um, technology for doing uh, crowns in office. Um, the same day. And, you know, I think a bunch of people have, a bunch of practitioners have in, invested in that technology, but just think about that. That's just one facet. Think of another modality that could be used on basically everything else in your office. So the ROI on Call Meme is very, very strong in, in my opinion. Um, and um, this is a, uh, this is from a, consulting firm Aprio. They had a dental intelligence software and did an analysis of over 10,000 practices. And this is really quite eye-opening. There's an analysis of over 10,000 practices um, before cone beam and after cone beam. Um, if you're bottom 10% of practices, you know, you, you not in general going to be investing in a cone beam in general, but let's look at the at the average practice and top 10%. You can see they call this PPV, production per visit. The average practice production per visit, $319 prior to cone beam, after $398. That's $79 or is it 89? 79, $79. Um, increase per visit. In the top 10% of practices, uh, the premier practice even more, over $100, $105 per visit. So think about that for a minute. It's not hard at all to rack up 2,000 appointments. So do the math there. That's over $200,000 incremental. You just paid for a couple, three, four cone beams right there. So... And an obligatory Zig Ziglar quote to end the presentation, if you're not willing to learn, no one can help you. If you're determined to learn, no one can stop you. So if you don't have a cone beam, be willing to learn. Look into it. Um, speaking from experience, you that it will absolutely benefit you. As I mentioned, 
a lot of what I do now is practice transitions, mergers, acquisitions. I'm dealing with very, very high profile practices that are now in a very good position in the market um, in this space. And a lot, and I would say the majority of the practices put in a cone beam and it really helped to build their practice to the point that it's at now. And as a result, they are in a very advantageous position in this uh, dental uh, market that is, um, you know, consolidating with, uh, it's called equity arbitrage consolidation. So it's another topic for another night, but thank you very much, um, Stephen. Thank you for you and Henry Shine having me do this webinar really enjoyed it and now we finished up about 10 minutes early so we have about 10 minutes for question and answer fantastic thank you so much for um that presentation ty um we actually have lots and lots of questions that have come in so we'll try and get to uh, as many as possible um so the first question uh here for you ty is uh, can you see fractures in a ct Yes, absolutely. It depends on the resolution. I have seen root fractures in um, uh, all the way up. I had some scans that were actually 0.4 millimeter voxel, which is low resolution in which you could see fractures. In general, you'll you you can see most fractures under the high resolution, but yes, the answer is absolutely. You can definitely see root fractures, vertical root fractures, horizontal um, with cone beam, absolutely. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Next question, how many voxels can the human eye see? Um, yes, great question. I'm trying to, uh, I believe the, I remember a study, I want to say that the human eye can only distinguish down to 0.125 millimeter voxels. There are some machines that go down to, uh, you know, about half the size of that or lower, but it, I believe I remember a presentation that was 0.125 millimeters. Okay, perfect, thank you. All right, next question. Um, this is about liability. Uh, Dahlia says, I'm an orthodontist, and if I take it for orthodontic purposes, which I understand the value of it, but uh, will I be responsible for reading the whole face imaging? Mm -hmm. Excellent question. Probably a question that's been posed to me well over a thousand times, and I'll throw out the disclaimer that I'm not a lawyer, so, you know, do your own research, but I think in doing that research, you will discover, talk to your peers as well. Um, also, um, attorney Art Curley out of California has done many lectures on this. Um, hopefully you don't know him because he's the largest dental malpractice lawyer in the nation. So it's good if you don't know him, but he will tell you at least um, I had a, a somewhat recent conversation with him and he said um, he if if there is some kind of complication with a patient and 3D data has not been obtained, he claims or he, he told me that he uh would in all likelihood not be able to represent someone that did not have 3d data on a patient and there was a complication speaking from personal experience over 800 cone beams sold i personally uh, was never made aware or had an issue at, at uh, scan and something uh being held liable again quoting um uh art curly uh he had said that uh it's there's a uh it's outside uh outside the, there are many things that are outside your scope of practice um, if you're an oral surgeon and you're an MD, um, there are a few more, uh, you have a little bit li more liability than just a dentist. Um, but in general, um, those type of things, you are not, um, 
uh, you know, a, a radiologist is the one who is trained to uh, diagnose cancer. So uh, the general sentiment is that that is outside the scope of your practice. Um, also, as an orthodontist, just uh, I'm sure many of your peers have cone beam. Um, ask them. Um, I'm quite sure that many of them are taking a cone beam on every single patient. Um, and the, um, you know, again, it can easily be argued that the, um, that the, uh, information, exponentially more information that you get from taking a cone beam um, is very justified in regards to, you know, versus not taking one because of, of the risk of missing something. Great, thank you, Ty. Okay, uh, next question. Can I get rid of full mouth x-rays if I have CBCT? Uh, no, no, uh, cone beam, if you want, you know, to, the, 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 the gold standard for caries detection is still going to be an intraoral sensor. It's because, um, if you imagine hat shining a light on your hand up against a wall and you put that light right up on your hand and your shadow is extremely sharp, and then you move the light away and your shadow becomes a little blurred. Same, same kind of principle. You need, for exquisite caries detection, you need that sensor right up on the tooth for uh, specific caries detection. So although 2D does have its limitations, um, you know, not great at, at, at spotting all abscesses, but um, one of the advantages is that, you know, it is the gold standard still for caries detection. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, okay, next question. Are there any requirements for me to put something in the wall surrounding a CBCT? Where do I find out in my state what the requirements are? And would my Henry Shine rep know? Yes, your Henry Shine rep would know, get with them. Um, it varies from state to state. Um, I had, I can tell you that about, I can tell you that less than 5% of the 800, over 800 cone beams that I installed required any kind of special shielding, um, in, in general, in general, the answer is going to be no, but, uh, occasionally there will be a situation in which, um, there will be a uh, lead shielding required in some states. It's simply not required. Okay. Uh, the next question touches on something you mentioned already. Um, should I have a radiologist review all of my CBCT? And if so, what is normally the cost of a review? Uh huh. Um, it's uh, it's up to you. Um, it's at your discretion. So um, I can't tell you that it's required to have it done. It's you can learn a lot by having your scans read. It's a, it's a great, uh, especially starting out. Um, there are no, there are, are a number of different um, outfits out there that can read the scan for you. In general, it's going to cost you seventy to a hundred dollars um, to get the scan read by a radiologist. Um, one of my uh, one of my go tos in that regard was a company called Beam Readers. They can be they're at beamreaders.com. I don't have any financial affiliation with them. It's just they do great work. They have a whole team of radiologists. Um, the general rule um, that my practitioners have, have that I've seen, you know, my customers use the general rule is if you if you see something odd, if you see a pathology, then send a then send it to a radiologist to read. Um, it's the general sentiment in the industry that not every single combing scan has to be sent to a radiologist. Okay. Great, thank you. Next question is from Howard. Uh, what system would you recommend for integrating in a CREC workflow and to print surgical guides? Um, and, you know, like I said, it's a, it's a, it, you know, it's an agnostic, uh, brand agnostic uh, uh, seminar. But you know, I would say, you know, there is a manufacturer that manufactures CREC. They also make a cone beam that, you know, that could make a lot of sense for you. I would look at your overall workflow. 
Um, I can tell you that all cone memes put out the same file format, DICOM.DCM, and you can do with that what you want in many different modalities, but many people do invest in the complementary uh, cone beam that goes along with um, you know, the CEREC in that case. Is it is it an absolute? No, you don't have to, but like I said, I would get with your rep and determine your specific, how you're specifically going to be using it. And if you really need the two to come together. Um, so I would just get with your rep for more info on that. But, you know, sometimes in, in cases that uh, people will go with all one manufacturer on that. So the answer could be yes, could be no, depends on your specific situation. Okay, great. Thank you, Ty. Okay, next question. Is CBCT good for determining bone quality? Uh, it is, CBC is not traditionally uh, great at, uh, it's called Hounsfield units. It's not, it has not traditionally been uh, great at uh, determining bone density. Um, that's one of the few things that, and it doesn't pick up the gingiva as well. Um, and it doesn't detect caries well. So it pretty much does everything else well. Okay, brilliant. Well, with that, Ty, I think we're just about out of time. Um, do you have anything Great. to say before we finish up? Uh, no, thanks everybody for, for your time. Um, you've got my information here. There's my website um, and you can go uh, use the QR code to go to my website right on your phone. There's a links to text me, call me, even schedule a 30 minute consultation with me. I um, would be happy to help anyone out. And uh, I thank Henry Schein and you, Stephen, for having me. And I uh, uh, would also like to thank Gary Severance for getting me involved in this project and, um, and really enjoyed it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Ty. Thanks for a wonderful presentation this evening. And uh, thank you to all of you for joining us as well. Um, so good news, we did record this evening's webinar and we'll be emailing out that recording sometime during the next week. Uh, one thing we'd really appreciate is your feedback. Uh, so in a minute, a survey is going to pop up on your screen and we'd love it if you could take one minute to fill that out for us. So thank you to all of you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Thanks. Thanks.